Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes or no? Yes. 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 Good. Well, it's my great pleasure to be here, and, and I'm very pleased that you would come out on an evening like this to, to talk about the Constitution. And this is due entirely to the new vision that Marco Canuccio has brought to the uh, Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Uh, I just mentioned this might be a good idea, and then I suddenly found myself doing it. <laughs> uh, so here we are. And I uh, deeply appreciate and am honored by my association with OCPA. And one of my proudest titles is to be the David and Ann Brown Distinguished Senior Fellow because OCPA is the result, again, of a unique vision by Dr. Brown to call us back to our fundamental principles of limited government and low taxation. And the other uh, proud title I have is to be the GT and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty. And 20 years ago, before anybody got concerned and saw what the possible developments in our country, the Blankenships had the idea of endowing a chair devoted to the study of the most important idea for America. Wouldn't you agree that freedom is the most important idea in America, but there wasn't a chair anywhere that studied it? All sorts of other things were studied, and that it would be devoted primarily to teaching undergraduates. And we continue that mission of teaching all, a broad public, about the importance of freedom because we stand at a crossroads in our country today. A crossroads just as important as the time of the American Revolution or the American Civil War in which decisions we make in the upcoming election will determine the history of our country and the history of the world for generations to come. Now, the founders of our country, that ought to be a nonpartisan word, but it's not. And as I lecture across the country from Delaware to, Los, to Palo Alto, California, you can see an audience's ears begin to close down when they hear the word founders, whereas in the heartland they open up to learn more about them. But who were the founders? Think what they achieved. Now, they declared our independence from the greatest superpower of the day. What was that? Great Britain. Great Britain. The best army in the world, absolute dominance of the sea. But we not only declared our independence from Britain, we then won it on the field of battle. And that was achieved not by John Adams. It was achieved by the ordinary American who carried the revolution on his bayonet for seven long years. But there have been other revolutions in history. The French Revolution that ended in chaos. Ours ended in a constitution devised by these same founders but ratified by the ordinary American which still gives you liberty under law today more than 200 years later. Do you ever ponder that miracle? That in an age in which Benjamin Franklin uh, traveled in the same way that Julius Caesar did. He walked, he rode, he sailed. And the United States was nothing but 13 little republics along the eastern seaboard. That same constitution gives us freedom more than 200 years later when we are the global power and when you right now are text messaging somebody while I'm talking. <laughs> saying, I hope he shuts up soon. <laughs> now that is an extraordinary achievement. Uh, tell me another constitution that has lasted so long and worked so well. You can't. And that same set of founders and same generation of Americans then made the constitution work. There have been all kinds of constitutions written. Almost none of them have worked. This one worked because of the first president, George Washington, and the first Congress made it work and converted those who doubted it. So that's an extraordinary achievement, and it was not an accident. You see, it came about because the founders of our country thought historically. What do I mean by thinking historically? We do not think historically today. 
We have lots of good best-selling biographies of historical figures, have the History Channel, but historical knowledge is good for nothing but trivial pursuit. Historical thinking means to use the past to make decisions in the present and to plan for the future, and we don't do that. That's why we ended up in this financial crisis. We thought we were so smart that all the lessons of the past were put aside. Science and technology had put us above the lessons of the past. But the founders used those lessons of the past. And one of the lessons was the eternal tension between tyranny and freedom, between a government strong enough to protect you and one so strong that it took away your freedom. To understand that, I want you to go back with me, away from this pleasant evening in Edmond, and go back to an early morning about 5 a.m., the 19th of April in 1775. And we are in Lexington, Massachusetts. We've just arrived and we are foot sore. For you are British soldiers. 700 of the best, best British soldiers in the best army. Part of a garrison of 2,000 in Boston. And you have been sent out the night before on a perfectly legitimate mission. You have been sent out by the governor, General Gage, to confiscate illegally held weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> cannons. Well, what other purpose does a cannon have except to kill lots of people? Do you hunt duck with a cannon, yes or no? <laughs> no. And the English Constitution is quite clear on this fact. An Englishman may hold weapons suited to his rank, and it is not suited to the rank of the colonials on their own to have cannons. But the governor of Massachusetts, the royal governor, has very good intelligence <laughs> that these cannons exist there in the city of Concord and possibly Worcester. And up until the last minute, following good military intelligence, it wasn't decided which town they would march to. But the Committee of Public Safety there in Boston, Patriots, acting absolutely illegally, carefully watched the army march out and row across the bay. It would be one lantern hung in the old North Church if they went by land, which meant they were going to the town of Worcester, and two if they went by sea. They rowed across the harbor and then began their march towards the town of Concord. So all along that way, the message has been spread. And you, you 700 Britishers, are getting more and more worried about this. Because you think these farmers ought to be asleep in the middle of the night, but all their houses are lit up. And you're hungry. You've been up for 36 hours now. In typical military fashion, they rowed you across, then had you stand for three hours while they went back to get rations when you already had rations. Then they marched you across a stream. Well, this didn't bother the two officers leading you. They were on horseback. But you were on foot, and you wore silk socks that got wet and then gave you blisters. So you've marched 12 miles, and you're in a very cranky mood. <laughs> and then to make the morning worse, there are 77 militiamen on the green barring your way through the town of Lexington to the city of Concord. Now, these are not mere farmers. You, some of you have already fought alongside them in the French and Indian War that ended in 1763, when Americans were proud to proclaim themselves the subjects of the greatest empire in the world. So they know your tactics, and they are well drilled. Amazing to say, in this far off time, there was a draft. Every colony had a militia law and everybody from 16 on up to my age was required to be in the militia, to meet on a regular basis and train and drill in the use of firearms. If you could not provide a musket, it was provided for you. And a militia company had to equal 100. And if there weren't 100 in your county, they came and got you. So these are well-trained soldiers, 
and they are determined to defend their freedom. Now, far off across the ocean, King George thinks he knows what is best for his constituents. In fact, the American Revolution, with one exception I can think of in more recent years, is the best example of a government that knew better than its citizens what was best for them. And surely what the American colonies really, if they just understood it, was more taxes <laughs> and a more centralized government. It was just old-fashioned and medieval to, for Georgia to have a different legislature than Connecticut. And uh, after all, the king had paid to remove the danger of the French from them, so why shouldn't the Americans pay their fair share of the taxes? And he'd started off in a very gradual fashion, much the same way that President Obama, do you remember, wanted to tax soft drinks? Do you remember that, yes or no? Yes. Well, they started off wanting to tax sugar. And they just moved it on up. And at no time did they ask the Americans what they wanted. So by now, in this year, 1775, the Americans have come out on the green there in Lexington to say, we want no more taxes unless we are represented in Parliament. And we are conscious of our freedom, and we will defend it. Well, this is treason. And the commander, General, uh, Colonel Francis Smith, an elderly portly man, rode up to the rebels standing out there. And he said, lay down your arms and disperse, you damned rebels. And their commander, Colonel John Parker, the Lexington militia said, don't fire, boys. But if they want a war, let it start right here. And someone, and we will never know who, fired that first shot. And the British responded superbly. Seven Americans were killed. One was bayoneted in front of his own wife and child as they stood there horrified. After all, you had told him not to go out, correct? <laughs> he said, stay home. This is a bad idea. And now he is getting bayoneted in front of you. And you also blame it on that stop he made at the tavern, Buckland Tavern, where we could still go today. So it has started. And now the two officers commanding, Colonel Smith and Major Pitcairn, a major of Marine, they're like any other good military men. They're worried now. They've killed seven of the king's subjects, correct? Don't you think there's going to be an inquiry into that? So they've got to find those weapons of mass destruction. So despite this warning, they go on down. And they arrive in the town of Concord about 10 o'clock in the morning. And the town seems quiet. And 600 of them are sent scurrying off to try to find these cannons that these farmers have hidden. And 100 are detached to be a watch. And they go down to the far end of the town where there's a bridge over the Concord River. And nothing's happening, so they lie down in the, in the grass and begin to doze. And about 11 o'clock, these soldiers hear something like a buzzing of bees. And they look up, and there come down 2,000 militiamen from all of the surrounding counties and from towns like Sudbury and Acton, each of them wearing their regulation uniforms, well-trained in the use of their firearms, and able to fight in British formation. And these militiamen mean business. They come down, the British jump up and get into their formation, and the militiamen fire upon them send the British back across the bridge. One of them is dangling there, and he is tommyhawked. And the British shout, these are terrorists. They are scalping us. And by this time, it's turned into a very serious situation. But by that rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April breeze unfurled, there the embattled farmers stood, and fire the shot heard round the world. And they followed the British all the way back to Boston that long, bloody afternoon, firing at them from behind the stone walls, meeting them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And by the time the British limped back into Lexington, they were on the verge of surrender. But 700 more troops had been sent up by the British governor, who feared he had not sent enough, and he'd sent two cannons. 
And behind that protection, the British made their way back to Boston. Roughly one half of their command was killed or wounded. And in 1775, to be wounded was pretty close to having been killed given the surgery of the time. Now, I worry that if this, something like this should happen today, that all of those militiamen would immediately hire an attorney <laughs> and show up the next day for a plea bargain. And you would convince him he had made a big mistake. So there you'd be. Not these. And the British thought that having made their point, the Americans would essentially ask for an amnesty. Not at all. And within two weeks, 16,000 New England farmers had left their fields at the most critical time of the year. I mean, after all, if they didn't get a crop in, could they go to the Walmart and buy some food? Yes or no? They grew it. And at this most critical time of the year, they left their fields, they went to Boston, and began a regular European siege of the city. And when the British tried to break that by putting cannons up on Bunker Hill, they found themselves again outwitted by these Americans who entrenched themselves first on Bunker Hill on June the 16th and then drove back the British in two straight frontal assaults and then retreated in good order only when they had run out of ammunition. And by July the 3rd, 1775, the Congress meeting absolutely illegally in Philadelphia had given command to George Washington. And he took over the army there under the elm tree in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And John Adams' wife, watching this, wrote her husband and said, I thought Washington the most handsome man in the world. They put a little up, except for you, of course, my darling. <laughs> and so it had come to war. And all through that summer, on into the fall, the question was, what's our next step? And Washington from very early on was convinced that the only step was independence. But there are many who doubted this. Why would you be doubtful about declaring your independence? I mean, after all, you didn't know you were going to be sitting in Edmond, Oklahoma in the year 2010 knowing that this was all history, correct? You were a what? A traitor. What did the British do to traitors? Did they give them lawyers and things like this? And no, that you were drawn, hang, hang, drawn, and quartered. Do you know what that meant? They hanged you by the neck until you were almost dead. They put you on a rack and drew you till your bones popped out. And then they disemboweled you while you were still alive and burnt your entrails before your eyes. Now, is that a good way to die? No. So, as long as we continue this way, we are rebels one way or the other. But the only way we're going to win is with aid from France. And once again, the King of France is not going to recognize a bunch of rebels. But if we declare our independence, our ships will no longer be pirates. We will at least have to be accorded the status of a belligerent. But most said no, that this will be a complete break with Britain, and our best hope are our friends in Parliament. And so it went on all through the winter. And then in that winter, one of the most important books ever written by Tom Paine, an Englishman, Common Sense. Now today it'd be on the YouTube. Then it was just pirated. He made almost no money from it. But all over the, uh, the colonies, this was read. And it simply said what we ought to remember today. It's just common sense that we keep our freedom. England is our mother country. Do you going to live with your mom when you're 40 years of age? Yes or no? <laughs> England has protected us. England would protect Turkey if it was in its own best interest. No, it is common sense that such a grand and glorious nation should be free. Thus, by the spring of 1776, the delegates came. Now, they represented their individual states, but a majority of them had received instructions that if the flow of the discussion was that way, they could vote for independence. 
So they met there in Philadelphia where we can still go today and they debated the question. They debated it on well into June and there were real patriots like John Dickinson of Pennsylvania who would later sign the Constitution who said, no, this is inopportune. But a resolution was introduced to declare our independence and a committee of five headed by Thomas Jefferson was set up to write a declaration that would tell the world why we had done this if the resolution were carried. And the debate continued. And South Carolina and Pennsylvania remained opposed. And Delaware was split one and one. The other delegate from Delaware was at home in bed, Caesar Rodney. Then on the morning of the 4th, a morning of the 3rd, the delegates from Pennsylvania who were in favor of independence all showed up. Those who were opposed stayed at home. And South Carolina said that they would go along in the interest of unanimity. But the delegate from Delaware said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm opposed to it. I vote no. It's not going to be unanimous. So they went and sent a message to Caesar Rodney, sick in bed. He got out of bed, rode through a terrible thunderstorm, shaking with chills, to arrive on the morning of the 4th and to break the deadlock. What was his reward? He appears on the state quarter of Delaware. Don't you save these quarters? <laughs> yes or no? You should. I never spend one of them. They're great instruments of history. Did you think that was a jockey? <laughs> no, that is Caesar Rodney riding through the night to sign the Declaration of Independence. Massachusetts has a militiaman. New Jersey has uh, Washington crossing the Delaware. I still ponder why we have the scissor tail, whatever he is on there. <laughs> I think we could have had a more historical figure. But at any rate, there's Caesar Rodney. And so on the 4th of July, the Declaration of Independence was signed. And don't let some pot-bellied professor try to convince you that nothing happened on the 4th of July. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin all said on the 4th of July, 1776, we stood up and signed the Declaration of Independence. And when did Thomas Jefferson die? July, July the 4th, 1826. When did John Adams die? Yeah. July the 4th, 1826. And in both cases, their doctors had given them up days before, but they hung on. So you're going to tell me nothing important happened on July the 4th? No, the Declaration was signed. Now that in itself put our revolution on a totally different level than others that have happened before or subsequently. Unlike the Bolshevik revolutions, we did not seize power in the middle of the night. It was not a conspiracy against King George. It was an open declaration of the mistakes he had made and why it was necessary to found a new nation. Now we're going to use freedom all the way through these lectures. And I want you to define freedom for me. How do you define freedom? You're right there in the check shirt. Yes, you. <laughs> Don't look to your son, you tell me. Uh, freedom is the, uh, I guess, the ability to do the things we want to do without the government. Freedom is the ability to do what we want to do without government interference or to, to live as we choose without harming somebody else. And most of the founders would agree with you that that was one part of freedom. In fact, they all would have. But freedom as we use the term, in fact, consists of three component parts. There's national freedom, there is political freedom, and there's individual freedom. National freedom is our freedom from foreign domination. Political freedom is our freedom to vote, to hold office, to serve on juries. And then individual freedom is just as you have said. Freedom to live as you choose as long as you harm no one else. Now they do not always go together. North Korea has national freedom. Has it any political freedom? Has it any individual freedom? Germany of Hitler gave up individual freedom and political freedom for national greatness. But in this country, we have achieved a unique blend of those three freedoms. 
No other country in history has so well blended these. And I think that's a miracle. And I don't know why schools don't more often teach that America is unique. It is exceptional. We have such national freedom we can't imagine being conquered. Our political freedom, you take it for granted. I never get too worried when there's a low voter turnout because that means they just take it for granted. And then your individual freedom, you are more free to live here than anywhere else in the world. Are thousands of people trying to cross the border into the Ukraine every day to live there so they can make a better life for themselves, yes or no? Does the Ukraine really even have trouble with immigration laws? No, they would beg people to come and live in that place. But we, we have people come here from everywhere just to live as they choose and for their children to have a better life. So there's that unique blend. But the start was our national freedom. Without that national freedom, you can do nothing. That's why we will say George Washington is the most and best, most important and best general in American history. Why? He won the most important war in American history. Why? Without that, there would be no other wars in American history, correct? <laughs> yes. So our national freedom. And from the outset, we have been unique. The United States is the only nation in history founded on moral principles. How did you get to be an Englishman in 1776? You were born there. It was a geographical accident. A German still today will tell you that you're a German if German is your mother tongue. We say come from anywhere in the world, have any language as your mother tongue, but adopt our principles and you become an American. And it is in the Declaration of Independence that we find those principles that tell us that when in the course of human events it becomes, becomes necessary for one people to break the political bonds that are bound it to another and to take its place, its equal status among the nations of the world, the status that has been granted to it by the laws of nature and of nature's God. It should declare the reasons for this separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that governments are instituted among men to achieve those goals. That is the purpose of government. And government derives its only legitimate authority from the consent of the governed. The law of nature and of nature's God and self-evident truths. What does that mean? A self-evident truth is an absolute truth. That is clearly what it meant to Jefferson and all of those who signed it. It is an absolute truth and it is the belief that some things are right in all places and in all times. How many of you believe that some things are right in all places and in all times? Okay, now you say that. But as a society, we do not believe that or act upon it. We believe as a society in situational truths. We had a president, and this is just a historical statement, it's just what he said, who said it depends on what your definition of is, is. <laughs> Now that is the best statement you will have that the circumstances determine whether you're lying or not. There is no such thing as absolute self-evident truths. There is no such thing as absolute justice. There is no such thing today as absolute beauty. Don't you remember that song? Everything is beautiful <laughs> in its own way. Well, for Plato and for the founders, there was absolute beauty. So a self-evident truth means that you believe 
in absolute truth. And if you ask a founder, well, just give me a few instances, this is just what they would have done. They would have said, look at the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Correct? No graven images. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Those are examples of absolute truths that all societies have recognized. They could have told you that even Genghis Khan, the greatest mass murderer in history, uh, began his code of laws with, some, everybody has to believe in God in my kingdom. I don't care what God, but you've got to believe in God. So that for the founders, the Ten Commandments, were the statement of absolute truth. And then from those absolute truths, you derive the idea that there was God. There could only be absolutes if it was rooted in a belief in God. And the best proof of the perfection of God was the universe. If you come here next year on this same date, May the 3rd, and it gets dark, will the stars still be in the same place? As they are tonight, yes or no? Yes. And for Jefferson, that was the statement of the perfection of God and his universe, and thus the rights that he had given. And those rights were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and then what did the pursuit of happiness mean? To Jefferson, it meant your right to be able to live your life in such a way that you left the world a better place. So those were the foundations and principles upon which our country was established, our national freedom was laid, and then they went on to list the ways in which King George had infringed specifically those fundamental rights. So this was a revolution based on absolute truth and a belief in God. How many times is God mentioned in the Declaration of Independence? Four. Who said that? Did somebody say that? Good for you. Four. Supreme judge of the world, divine providence, the God of nature. Now would that get through Congress today? <laughs> I, know, I know this is a serious question because if we don't have God anymore and we don't have absolute truth, then, as the lecture title says, what is the meaning of the Declaration of Independence for us today? As the Americans faced the great choice in 1860, an election that was the most important in our country's history, Lincoln told Americans again and again, the Declaration of Independence is the sheet anchor of our nation. It is the main anchor of our ship of state. And the question is, is it still the sheet an anchor of our nation? And now your eyes glaze over when you hear life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But let's go back to the founders. And then let's use their words today. Now for the founders, life was your right to live, just that simple. And they didn't scientifically debate when it began, it just was life. But today, that same word life is at the core of a debate in our country so divisive that we are afraid to talk about it publicly. And liberty, isn't liberty exactly why Congress has reached a complete deadlock? The right of the government to tell you what you know is best for you, correct? Yes or no? And time and time again, the question is, how far can I live my life without harming somebody else? And again, this is just historical. For the founders, the taking this to an absurdity was to have a board of surgeons set up by the government to make you live your life in a way that was healthy because otherwise you'd be harming the community. So when does your liberty start and when does it infringe upon him? We as a nation still are not in agreement about that. We are radically divided. And then finally, the pursuit of happiness. The idea of the pursuit of happiness is at the fundamental core of the whole debate about entitlements. 
Does your pursuit of happiness entitle you to a home? Does your pursuit of happiness entitle you to free medical care? But in the Athenian democracy of the 5th century B.C., every Athenian has a right, could be treated by the best physician in Athens. Does your uh, pursuit of happiness entitle you to welfare benefits? Well, that's what the pursuit of happiness requires us to answer. So we are no more clear about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness now. In fact, we are less clear than when our country was founded. So if we don't understand what is meant by life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if we don't believe in absolute truths, and we don't want God talked about in public life, then what is the meaning of the Declaration of Independence for us today? Well, the soldiers who fought this revolution believed in it. And there is no more touching scene in all of history than of George Washington with tears coming down his uh, uh, face reading this Declaration of Independence to these soldiers who had come out to fight for freedom. They understood it. They responded to it. When it was read from the balcony of the State House in Boston to a cheering crowd, when ministers read it, to their congregations in the backwoods of South Carolina and Georgia, they understood it. And they would carry it on their bandits all the way down through the cold winter at Yorktown, through the scourging defeats, until finally the triumph at Yorktown. So a noble revolution fought in the name of the moral principles which must still be the sheet anchor of our country. So the Declaration of Independence, its noble ideals, and the embodiment of a nation founded in God on absolute moral truths. And if we wish to reclaim that legacy, we must again take that ideal seriously and into our lives and demand that we remain true to that sheet anchor of our freedom. Well, thank you for listening to me. Well, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes or no? Yes. yes. See, I was just thinking, um, those of us who came were like George Washington and the few delegates who made it to Pennsylvania on time. The rest were delayed by May storms, and it took them two weeks to get a quorum. That's what we want to talk about tonight was the miracle there at Philadelphia that occurred in the summer of 1787 when a total of 55 men came together under the most pressing circumstances to solve an immediate issue, which was a debt and mortgage crisis that was freezing up the credit markets all the way to Europe and threatened to bring an end to our brief experiment with freedom. So the miracle at Philadelphia. But that is only one of the miracles that the founders of our country gave us. And that's the theme of this whole series, is the founders. What was their legacy and why could they achieve it? Because it is to the standard of the founders of our country that we should hold our political leaders today. And it is to the standard of those who followed that leadership in 1787, the ordinary American citizen, that we should hold ourselves. Because the founders did not create this miracle. The miracle was the ordinary American who chose them, 
who ratified the Constitution and then saw to it that it worked. Now, what did the founders do? Let's repeat it one more time. They declared their independence from the greatest superpower of the day. What was that? Great Britain. They then won that independence on the field of battle. Then they went on to give us a constitution that still gives us freedom under law more than 200 years later. How many other countries have a constitution that old and that good? Zero. And they gave us the Bill of Rights that guarantees our freedom every day. Now we began this lecture by talking about freedom, the legacy of freedom. And we decided that we use freedom in a very loose way. How did we decide we had to define freedom? You've already forgotten. <laughs> National freedom, political freedom, and individual freedom. Remember Socrates. He said that we do not get into quarrels over things that we can just prove. How much is two plus two? That's four. We're not going to argue over that. But it's things that have values attached to them. And no word is more laden with values than freedom. And we have caused a great deal of trouble for ourselves by using freedom in a loose way. Freedom consists of three separate components. National freedom, political freedom, individual freedom. Now I'll define national freedom for me. Who was here last time? What is it? It's your freedom from foreign domination. What's political freedom? Freedom to vote, to hold office, serve on juries. To the founders, serving on juries was a real test of a democracy. And then what is individual freedom? Freedom to live as you choose as long as you harm no one else. Now, we have achieved a unique blend of freedom in this country. And what is the testament, the statement of our national freedom? The Declaration of Independence. What is the, te the testament to our political freedom? The Constitution. And what is the testament of our individual freedom? The Bill of Rights. And through those three, we have achieved this unique balance. And the Declaration of Independence ensured that we are the only nation in history founded on what? Founded on moral principles. The country was founded in a belief in God and in moral principles, absolute right and wrong. The self-evident truth, what? That all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That all human beings in all places and in all times should have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness those were the moral principles upon which our country was founded. And there is no more touching scene in all of history than of George Washington in early July of 1776 reading to his troops the Declaration of Independence and the tears streaming down their face and his face as they understood and enunciated why they had undertaken this great struggle and why they must see it through to the end. And so they did. But go back with me to May of the, well, yes, May, early May of the year 1787. And we're with George Washington at Mount Vernon. Now six years have passed since the little British drummer boy climbed up on the ramparts at Yorktown on October the 17th and drummed out, rum bum, rum bum, rum bum. let's talk. And then General Cornwallis and General Washington sat down. Washington had marched 15,000 men down from New York. 8,000 of them were French. 
And no matter how mad we should get at the French from time to time, they were our first allies. And it was the French fleet that swept the British fleet out of Yorktown Harbor and made the encirclement of the British Army complete. And then 8,000 militiamen from Virginia joined them. And with those 23,000 men, with the French artillery, the British were forced to ask for terms. And Lord Cornwallis wanted the honors of war. That is to say, he wanted his army to march out under their own colors and play the tune that they chose. Washington would not give him terms. They had not given the terms of war to our prisoners. Washington would not give them to Cornwallis. And so it was that Cornwallis on the 19th said, signing the paper, His Majesty will be most annoyed. And he was, because through stupidity and failure to stay the course, the British had lost the fairest part of their empire, and the best and most industrious of the king's su subjects. But there was still the peace treaty to be won. And many times Americans have won wars and lost the peace. Certainly true of World War II, World War I. This was one time when we won the peace. And in 1783, three American diplomats, looked upon as bumpkins by, by the suave British and French and Spanish diplomats, John Jay, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, brought forth out of their negotiations an empire that stretched all the way out to the Mississippi. We really had no claim on anything beyond the Alleghenies. But by excellent diplomacy, we had gained this empire to ensure that unlike the city-states of Greece, we would never be hemmed in by narrow geographical limits. But by 1786, it looked as though all of this would be in vain. The wise heads of Europe, and the Europeans have never understood us. They still don't understand us today. They believe that we would soon end up with a dictator, a king, that a democracy could not function. How many functioning democracies were there in 1786? Zero. What was the best form of government? As all the wise commentators would have told you, a monarch who takes care of his people and sees to their well-being. So this democracy would fail and we would rapidly go the course of Rome and end up with a Julius Caesar. And who would be that Julius Caesar? George Washington. That's what the Europeans said. He'll be just like Cromwell. He'll overthrow the king and then set himself up as dictator or Lord Protector is what Cromwell called himself. And after all, they weren't too far off, were they? Because France would have a revolution that began in 1789, had a declaration of the rights of man, had a constitution, and ended up with who? Napoleon. So they weren't that far off. They just misunderstood the unique mission, the unique nature of America. But in 1786, a, finan a financial crisis broke out. And it broke out in the western parts of Pennsylvania, Virginia, Massachusetts. See, you came back from those years of war and you had your bonus money. And it was in script, issued by the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Massachusetts, state of Virginia. And you took that script, that paper, down to your local grocer, your hardware store. Now, um, you went in, uh, was there a sort of welfare system that had taken care of your farm or during all the years that you'd been away? Yes or no? In fact, you'd stand to stay in the army until 1783 because the British still had not made the treaty. So you were finally trying to get things working. You had waited all this time for your bonus money. You took it down and the hardware man said, I can't give you a plow. I can't sell you an ox. I can't sell you seed corn. I'm sorry your farm has gone to ruin, but that's just it. But I'm giving you this money. It is good, solid money. No, it's not. It's not worth the paper that it's written on. It's worthless. Something somebody might say to us someday about the $10 bill that you carry around in your pocket. Because there is no confidence in the state government that issued it or in the federal government that claims to stand behind it. 
because both the state government is deeply in debt and the continental government is deeply in debt. In fact, the national debt at that time in 1786 adjusted for inflation was about what it is today. And yes, and we don't think we can handle the situation. But it wasn't the bankers of China who owned our debt. It was the bankers of Holland and France. And they wanted their money paid. And you wanted your seed corn and you couldn't get it. And uh, your local merchant explained. It's because his wholesaler up in Boston wouldn't take it. And his wholesaler wouldn't take it and because the bankers in London and in Holland and Amsterdam wouldn't take it and in Paris. And the credit markets then froze all the way up to Amsterdam and Paris. And a world economic crisis began to loom. However, you weren't the sort of people we are today who sit by nervously and watch the um, Dow Jones go up and down and wondering why it's down 500 points today and up 100 tomorrow and watch your uh, retirement benefits just disappear. You weren't going to do that. Hadn't you just thrown the British out? Yes or no? So you got that same musket. You formed yourself into the same militia companies. One of them in Massachusetts led by, Gen uh, by Captain Daniel Shays, one of the many heroes of the revolution. And you marched upon the armory at Springfield to get the cannons and you were going to go right on down to Boston. You were going to take over the legislatures and you were going to make them take this money that they had paid you with. Well, the merchants in Boston got a militia together, stopped you. Some of you fled over the border into Canada. But wise heads understood that these Americans would stand up for their rights and their freedom, including their economic rights. So it was that in the fall of that 1786, as news of this rebellion was spreading all over the 13 states, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, younger founders, Hamilton had been the aide at the camp to uh, George Washington, and in fact had asked special permission to storm the British ramparts at um, Yorktown. They met at a, at, a, at a convention that had been called at Annapolis to try to deal with the navigation of the Potomac River in 1786. Now, the treaty with Britain had recognized 13 independent states, not the United States. It recognized the independence of New Hampshire, independence of Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, right on down to Georgia. These were 13 sovereign republics. And they had tariff barriers. If you were going to ship produce from Virginia to Maryland, you had to pay a tariff on it. New Jersey had no proper uh, port of its own, so it had to import everything through New York Harbor. And New York paced very heavy taxes on it. In revenge, New Jersey took a little spit of land on which there was a lighthouse. Now the lighthouse belonged to New York State, but the spit of land belonged to New Jersey, so they put a huge tax on it to get back at New York. Oh no, there were very strong sectional differences. Uh, there was a gentleman from um, New York who died and left a large estate to his grandson, but with the proviso that that grandson be educated anywhere except at Yale College, because he did not want him to learn the vile habits of the disgusting people of Connecticut. <laughs> now, so Hamilton and Madison met at this convention, which achieved nothing because the states would not give up their rights. And in fact, they were governed under the Articles of Confederation. And it was just that. It was a confederation, an alliance, a coalition of 13 independent states. And every state had one vote. And one vote by one state could block any changes. There was no executive. There were 99 committees trying to run the country. There was no power to tax, no power to keep a standing army. And frontiersmen in areas like Georgia and what would become Kentucky and Tennessee were already negotiating with the Spaniards to get protection against the Native Americans. So this could all very well just split apart. And so Hamilton and Madison talked there at Annapolis 
and they urged the need for a convention that would meet in the next spring as quickly as possible to revise the Articles of Confederation to make them workable. And all through that winter they campaigned for it. Finally in February the Congress that met in Philadelphia, the Congress of the Articles of Confederation, endorsed the idea of a convention, delegates separately elected to meet in Philadelphia starting on May the 11th to revise the Articles of Confederation. And immediately, Madison wrote to General Washington there at Mount, Mount Vernon, you have got to come and play a leading role. And Washington wrote back and said, I will have nothing to do with this business. I have retired. I am sick to death of politics and politicians. I want to spend my last few years with Martha on my farm and taking care of that farm. How many of you have been to Mount Vernon? Is it a palatial? No, it's just a nice working farm. And Washington didn't mind people coming to visit them, him. He said, I give them a slice of mutton and a glass of wine and send them on their way. But mainly he wanted to be with Martha. And you know, all during the terrible winter at Valley Forge, she stayed with him. And every morning he'd give the orders for the day. And then he and Martha would spend an hour alone. And nobody dared disturb them. So they were deeply in love, deeply happy, and she didn't want him to get involved anymore in politics. But then the governor, Edmund Randolph of Virginia, wrote Washington. He wrote back again and said, Governor, I'm not coming. Then George Mason, his close friend, the largest slave owner in America, wrote and said, You must come. And Washington said, Can you not get it through your heads? I am not coming. I want nothing more to do with politics, and this venture is going to fail. But by the time May rolled around, Washington had decided to go. Decided to give it one more chance because he knew all of the failings of the Articles of Confederation. However, there were a lot of people who liked the Articles of Confederation. Patrick Henry, the great patriot who said, give me liberty or give me death, refused to be appointed to this convention that was going to meet in Philadelphia. I smell a rat, he said. And others, like Samuel Adams said, we fought for liberty under the Articles of Confederation. We don't want it changed. We like it the way it is. We are separate and independent republics. So the 8th of May came. And Washington, as he got ready to leave Mount Vernon, was so stressed that he had what we would call a migraine headache. A sick headache, as he called it. And his wife said, don't go. And he said, I wish I hadn't promised, but I have. So I'm going. And the very weather was against him. Couldn't get across the river that night because of storms. Next day he was battered by storms. But by the time, on the, on the 10th, on Sunday of May, that his carriage began to approach the city of Philadelphia, all along the way, in silver helmets and silver breastplates and silver breeches, were the Philadelphia light cavalry come out to escort him. And as he rode into the town, the bells rang out through the city. Ding dong, ding dong. And there to greet him as he got down from his carriage was his old friend, Benjamin Franklin, who embraced him. And then the next morning at 11, at 11 uh, on the 11th at 10 o'clock, James Madison escorted Washington, they were part of the Virginia delegation, over to the Pennsylvania State House. How many of you have been to the Pennsylvania State House, Independence Hall? Is it a grand big place? The room that they debated in, is it a huge place? How many secretaries did they have? Zero. How many staff members? Zero. And in fact, it looked as though they were going to have no delegates either. Because they got there and there were the a few delegates from Pennsylvania and these two from Virginia. 11 o'clock came, 12 o'clock came, 1 o'clock came. Washington said, well, young Madison, why did you get me here? Uh, well, I don't know. Next day, still nobody. Next day, 14th, Washington said, I'm going home. But on the 15th, news came that, indeed, the weather had been bad. The winds were very contrary. Many of the delegates were sa sailing. The roads were bad. It could take up to a month to get there from Georgia. 
So they began to trickle in until by the 25th of May, two weeks late, they had their quorum. And the first thing they did was to recognize the fact that the state of Rhode Island had not sent any delegates and was not going to. They were called Rogue's Island. They liked a debt and mortgage crisis. They liked worthless money. And they weren't going to have anything to do with this convention. Then the second thing was to elect George Washington to preside over it. The third was to bar the press. Now they believed in the freedom of the press. Thomas Jefferson, who was not there, he was ambassador to Paris, said that if he had to choose between governments without newspapers or newspapers without government, he would choose to have newspapers. However, they wanted to be free to debate, to change their position, not to have to posture for the press, and not to have the equivalent of a microphone stuck in their face and be asked, uh, Dr. Franklin, 12 years ago you said that the best form of government was a single assembly. Why have you changed your mind on that? Is it really true, uh, Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts, that you believe that a tariff is necessary? Would you comment on that? So they didn't want that. Then they had the windows nailed shut and stationed soldiers around the State House to make sure the press didn't come. One time, General Washington came in and had some notes in his hands. And he said, uh, yesterday, after you had all left, I found these notes, very meticulous about what we have been talking about. Any person cleaning up could have taken these and given them to the press. Would the gentleman who left these notes please come up and get them? Nobody moved. But nobody left notes again. They took a word of honor, oath, that they would never tell what was debated in that convention. So seriously did they take their word of honor that James Madison, as one of the last of the surviving members of the convention, who had taken the most detailed notes, he took an act of Congress as he was on his deathbed to get him to agree to give up these notes and let them be published. So they debated these issues, and they debated them frankly among themselves. Now the next step was to get into action. What were they going to do? And what was their mandate? What had they been sent there legally to do? Revise the Articles of Confederation. And they took the bold step of saying the Articles of Confederation are worthless. They cannot be revised. We are going to have to come up with a new form of Constitution, and then we'll send that out to the people and let them decide. So the question was, what were you going to be your models? And there were 13 models that were already working. Not working totally well, but working. And they were the state governments. And these state governments had been originally modeled on the British uh, Constitution. What does Britain have? A strong executive in those days called the King. Two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Right? And it had an independent judiciary in those days. So that was the starting ground. Then very boldly, the governor of Virginia, Edmund Randolph, read forth a proposal that had been drafted for him by James Madison. And it was to have an executive, an independent judiciary, and two houses. Let's just call them the Senate and the House of Representatives for uh, convenience sake. And uh, both of these, the Senate and the House of Representatives, would be filled on the basis of proportionate representation. The amount of taxes the state paid and the number of citizens it had would determine how many members of the Senate and how many members of the House of Representatives. And this was lively debated, except Benjamin Franklin noticed that little states like Delaware, New Jersey, they didn't have much to say about any of this. And finally he turned to one of the delegates from Delaware and said, surely you must want to say something about this. And the delegate got up and said, do you know that Virginia, New York, and Philadelphia or Pennsylvania can, among themselves, control both houses of this? 
we will have nothing to do with it. Both houses will have one vote each, and that'll be that. We're going home otherwise. Now, a lot of their serious discussions occurred after the daily meeting had ended, at night, at dinner. And many of these men, and we of course don't approve of this, but it's just how they thought of themselves, prided themselves on being two bottle men. That is to say they could drink two bottles of wine at dinner. And I don't mean little bottles, the 75 milliliters. I mean great big quart bottles of wine. And then have punch before that and port after that. So by the time the dinner was over, you know, they were in much better humor than they had been when they, when they sat down. And in one of these dinners, when they seemed as though the whole convention was going to fall apart, Roger Sherman, we met him last time. He is a one of only six men who signed both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Self-made man, he had not gone to Yale College, but he sat on the board of Yale because he was so wealthy. And he had very sound common sense, which came from being a successful business person. Now, by the way, what was the only profession that was not represented at the Constitutional Convention? Oh, lots of lawyers. Oh, plenty of lawyers. I've told some of you this, professors. The only professional group not represented was professors. They have no common sense. <laughs> what constitution had the largest number of professors working on it to draft it? The Weimar Constitution of Germany after World War I that permitted Hitler to come to power. So there were no professors there. But a lot of them were real businessmen. Some of them were uh, merchants and, as I say, lots of lawyers and some physicians. So Roger Sherman, a merchant, a businessman, but a longtime patriot, sat down with um, several of the delegates from Virginia. And he said, you know, you've pushed this thing too fast. It looks like you're trying to take over this whole new system. Now, I want you to think one thing. Our job is to set priorities. And our first priority is do we want a constitution that works? Are we going to put all of our differences aside and get a constitution that works? You are never going to get that if you insist on proportionate representation in both houses. Now we have an interesting little system in Connecticut. In our lower house, it is by proportionate representation. But in the upper house, every township has two members. So they all have the same number of votes in the upper house. And the upper house can override the lower house, but the lower house in Connecticut has the right to start the financial bills going. Now why don't we just put that forward? And so they did. And that compromise, a house based on proportionate representation, a Senate based upon Every state having two votes, does it still work, yes or no? Yes. Now that's compromise, that's politics, but they made it work. So that one stroke got the issue of how the uh, legislative branch would be decided. But then came up the executive branch. And by now we were well into July. And that was a serious sticking point. These men knew their Roman history, and they knew that Julius Caesar, as commander-in-chief of the Roman armies, had become dictator of Rome, all of their constitutional limits notwithstanding. And that's exactly what they saw would happen. We cannot have a strong executive. Probably we ought to have four executives to balance each other off. One of the main problems we have now is we do not have an executive to run the country. Then again, at one of these dinners, it was suggested, what if General Washington would be the first president under this new Constitution? He won't do it. Well, we think he will. Ah, oh, that changes everything. If General Washington is the first president, he will never abuse his power. He will set a precedent. Now, don't you wish you had that kind of moral authority? that people would entrust their freedom to you. And so, 
the executive went through. No term limits. They trusted Washington to set his own term limits and commander-in-chief of the armies in the time of war with enormous influence over the nominating process like for Supreme Court justices, the great Washington. One occasion at one of these dinners as they were having the punch at the beginning, Washington was standing over in the corner like this. And uh, one of the more lively delegates was from uh, Pennsylvania, Governor Morris was his name, a younger man, but he had already lost a leg. He had lost his leg when he jumped out of an upper story bedroom window when a husband came home too quickly. Uh, then, then he would go on and get thrown out of Spain for carrying on an affair with the Queen of Spain. Finally come back home, married a wealthy widow later in life, and died conducting his own prostate surgery uh, with a whalebone, a sharpened whalebone. So he was a lively man even in his younger days. And he came up to Alexander Hamilton and he said, Hamilton, uh, the general is over there by himself. He's lonely. No, the general is not lonely. The general hates small talk. If there are ladies present, he will chat with them. Otherwise, leave him alone. Oh, you boys, you, you just treat him with too much, you know, deference. What if I go and clap him on the shoulder and call him George? Will you buy me dinner? Oh, I'll buy you the best dinner in Pennsylvania. So I walked up, clapped him on the shoulder. George, how are you this evening? <sighs> so Governor Morris crept back to Alexander Hamilton and said, I couldn't buy the dinner. I couldn't eat the dinner if you buy it anyway. No, but the great Washington. So he would be the executive. He would be the president. And then on through. The Supreme Court did not take them a whole lot of time. They went through that pretty quickly. And then the issue came up that they had all been dreading. They knew they could not step around it. It was the most divisive possible issue. And it came up when one of the delegates, William Blunt from North Carolina said, now how are we going to reckon the proportionate representation? What do you mean? I mean, North Carolina will only sign any constitution if all our slaves are counted fully. And Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts said, what do you mean? Counted fully. According to the law of North Carolina, African Americans are property. They aren't even individuals according to your horrible laws of slavery. That may be, but we're just telling you they're to be counted as full persons for the purpose of our proportionate representation. South Carolina agrees. Delaware agrees. Georgia agrees. Virginia agrees. We will walk out of this convention unless the slaves are counted as full individuals. Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts said, I won't sign any constitution that has slavery in it. And the Virginia delegation said, not only must it have slavery in it, this new national government that we are creating, it must ensure that if a slave escapes to a free state, the federal government has him brought back by force if necessary. Now we abhor slavery. We know how evil it was. But it was the law of the land in the states going all the way up to Delaware. Defenders of slavery said it was condoned by Moses in the Old Testament, by St. Paul in the New Testament, by the finest minds of classical antiquity, Aristotle and Cicero. It was simply a matter of choice. And they chose to have property in the form of human beings. And that was their right. Well, there you are. You were going to split. And that night the dinner was very gloomy. And the next day it was a gloomy debate. And by the third day it seemed as though all of this work was going to be swept aside. Now, you are politi political leaders. What does a politician or a statesman have to do every day? Compromise and set priorities. It is the setting of the priority that enables you to make the right compromise. What is your priority? To get rid of slavery, which you're not going to do, 
are, have a constitution, and hope that God in His own good time will get rid of slavery. What are you going to do? And so it was decided that a slave would count as three-fifths of a person. Well, this had a precedent from the Articles of Confederation. And so it was worked out. Now we were getting on into September, and the delegates were eager to get home. Some had gotten so enraged over all of these compromises that they had gone home. One of these delegates was from one of the most important states, New York. Since it was going to only have two votes, just like Delaware in the uh, Senate, they had gone home. But when they all went home, one of them came back, Alexander Hamilton, who wanted this strong constitution. So New York only had one delegate left. But they began now to create a committee of style to take all the articles that they had discussed and to put them into a readable format. And they chose Gouverneur Morris, who was a very fine stylist, to be the leader of this committee on style. And so they worked along. And by mid-September, they had it in shape. And their work, they believed, was coming to an end. But then the question arose, well, one, how are we going to sign this thing? What do you mean? We're all going to sign it, all of us here. And it will be unanimous of all the delegates here. Elbridge Gary of Massachusetts, a very skinny little man. He had signed the Declaration of Independence. And when he was uh, signing it, um, he turned to Robert Morris, who was also one of the two, one of the six men who had signed both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But in 1776, Gary said, well, you know, Morris, you're luckier than I am. When King George hangs us, you, a big fat man like you, you're just going to go boom and be dead. I'm skinny. I'm going to dangle like a fish. <laughs> so he raised his head and said, I'm not going home. I'm staying right here, and I'm not signing it. Then Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, said, I'm not signing it, and I'm not going home. And Washington looked at him like, you're the one who got me here. <laughs> and then George Mason of Virginia. His plantation, just what was fenced, was larger than the city of Philadelphia. He was the largest slave owner in all of America. He stood up and said, I will not sign this. Why? You were one of the leading forces bringing us to this convention. I will not sign it because it has slavery in it. It has slavery in it. You're the largest slave owner in America. I know. And I know how evil slavery is. And I know we must deal with it now. We cannot compromise around it. So I will not go home, and I will not sign it. Well, what are we going to do? Wise Benjamin Franklin said, we can get a positive vote from all 12 states, correct? Alexander Hamilton said, well, I mean, New York only has one person, but yes, I'll vote for it then we can legitimately say that it was unanimous among the states that were here. Correct? Sure. Yes. Good. Good. All right. So it came the morning of the 17th, and they were all prepared to sign for it. And then William Blunt of North Carolina raised his hand and said, there's one thing that troubles me. What is that? Well, you know, we're supposed to have one representative for every 40,000. Yeah. Well, I think we need it one for every 30,000. So I, I uh, propose that we amend it there. Oh, well, I propose we amend here. I propose we amend here. Oh, here, 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 here. Whole thing began to unravel. You ever been in a committee group like that? <laughs> and suddenly Washington said, gentlemen, my position as president has prevented me from speaking on any matter of substance up until this point. Now I say, 30,000 sounds good to me. Will we please just sign? Okay, that's 30,000. So they got ready to sign, but still, Benjamin Franklin said, We ought to all sign it. He was so ill and old by now that he couldn't even read his speech that he had written. So he gave it to a friend. And that got delegate read forth We have worked all summer on this. I think we have a good constitution. It is not perfect. But the one thing I have learned in life is nothing human is perfect. 
We could come back next year. We might come up with a better constitution. Maybe not. We have done our job. We now send it out to our fellow citizens, and they will do their job. They will make the final decision. We are not perfect. Send it out to our fellow citizens. And so one by one, they stepped up and began to sign. And all the time that they were signing it, Benjamin Franklin kept looking at George Washington, who was seated up at the front, looking like this. Washington finally said, Dr. Franklin, what are you doing? There is a sun painted on the back of your chair, General. Yes. All through these meetings, I have wondered whether that sun was a rising sun or a setting sun. And now I'm sure, General, that it is a rising sun. Thank you, my old friend. And then they went out into the sunshine, and a large crowd had gathered because word had gotten out that they were doing something important that day. And a woman rushed up to Benjamin Franklin, and she said, well, doctor, do we have a monarchy or a republic? And Franklin said, Madam, you have a republic if you can keep it. And so it went out to the states to debate, and their conventions called for that purpose. Now, the debate over the ratification of that Constitution called forth a body of political science and literature equal to Plato and Aristotle. The Federalist Papers, written not as, you know, uh, sound bites and these shrieking heads on television, but long, elaborate discussions of why the executive would work, how the balance of power would work, what an impeachment would be about. And on the other side, men like George Mason, Edmund Randolph, Richard Henry Lee, who had put forth the original resolution for the Declaration of Independence. They wrote on why this national government was too big, too strong, and would raise too much taxes and be fiscally irresponsible. And so it was debated back and forth. But one issue kept coming up, and that is to say, where was a Bill of Rights? The English Constitution had a Declaration of Rights. The King of England had to guarantee to his subjects their individual rights, like the freedom of the press. Where was a Bill of Rights in this? You know, some of the delegates were caught. I mean, said, well, wow, we never even really thought about it. Uh, well, you should have. And one by one in each of the state ratifying conventions, it was ratified with a provision based only on the verbal promise that a Bill of Rights would be the first task undertaken by the first Congress to meet under this Constitution. Now, would you entrust your individual freedom to the verbal promise of a politician? <laughs> well, these were men of honor. And so it was ratified. And Washington was sworn in as the first president, and that first Congress sat down to carry out its task. Now, if that first Congress had failed in two years to carry out its important task, the same way Congress right now is doing nothing, that Constitution, as we know it, would be nothing but a footnote in history for students to come up and ask a professor, are you going to give us a question about this American Constitution because you talked about it only for 10 minutes? No, they sat down and they did their job. And the American people expected nothing less. Daniel Webster would later say, hold fast to the Constitution. Miracles do not occur in clusters. But what was their task? Not just the Bill of Rights, not just to come up with a means of governing the vast new territories, 
that would become states like Indiana and Illinois, but also what we started with, to solve that debt and mortgage crisis. Whether they could do that or not, well, come back next time, and we'll see. Thank you.